You've got teenagers at home who are socializing on their tech. They're staying connected via their tech. They're schooling on their tech. They're unable to meet with each other. And so parents are, a lot of parents are very worried about where that line is drawn. Should I be trying to control my tech use as much as I was before COVID and so on? And I think overarchingly, no, the uh, rules now need to change. We need to renegotiate those parameters. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you, your loved ones, or clients suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health practitioners from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal. If you like this interview, please do subscribe and forward to others who might find it helpful. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. Mandy Saligari, welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. So you are the co-founder and clinical director of Charter Harley Street and a registered therapist. You're a published author and regular contributor to press, radio, and television. I would say you originally specialized in addiction treatment and codependency, and you entered the field after coming into recovery in 1990 and quickly earned a reputation for clinical excellence and very successful outcomes. And you wrote Proactive Parenting, which is very, very good. And you've got a three-part series in therapy for Channel 5. Now, there are a lot of other things I could say about you because you've got a very complete biography, but I will leave it there because I know we don't have much time. But what I wanted to ask you, Mandy, is about two years ago, you were doing a Mind Health 360 event on sort of how to navigate technology and technological devices and social media for better mental health, because we know that's a huge problem. Now, two years on, because of this pandemic and the fact that we're all sort of in lockdown at home, or a lot of us are or have been, we become so incredibly reliant on our computers and on our devices. And, you know, both for homeschooling, so our kids are on these devices, we're on the devices all day long. So in light of that, how do you advise people to handle the fact that they're constantly online, constantly on screens, that their kids are constantly on screens? Obviously, we have to live with this. But what would you tell parents and adults and kids and teenagers on how to navigate these devices, given the things that we've explored in the event and the dangers of them and the pitfalls? but in light of our increased dependence on them? Okay, so I think where I would start is to say, I mean, I get asked this a lot at the moment, which is what's the difference between addiction and the sort of context that we're living in at the moment, which is the COVID context. And fundamentally, addiction is when you are using something in an attempt to fix how you feel to detrimental effect. So... For example, if you have emotions you can't cope with and you outsource them to something like tech use, then you create a a dependence. So if every time I'm angry or every time I'm sad, I go on to tech to distract myself away, I might gain momentary relief, but uh, I never actually learn how to handle those emotions. So fundamentally, the um, the kind of core principle of addiction is that you outsource your emotional process onto something else and thereby create dependence and create an immaturity in yourself because you never learn how to handle those feelings. So that's the premise of addiction. This isn't about how much we use, it's about why you use something and what happens to you as a result. So then you cut to massive kind of tech use You've got teenagers at home who are socializing on their tech. They're staying connected via their tech. They're schooling on their tech. They're unable to meet with each other. And so parents are, a lot of parents are very worried about where that line is drawn. Should I be trying to control my tech use as much as I was before COVID and so on? And I think overarchingly, no, the uh, rules now need to change. We need to renegotiate those parameters. Um, If you're fortunate enough to have uh, children, teenagers that you can talk to, um, then that's a big plus, because I think we need to be uh, talking with our teens. They need to be talking to us. I was talking to, I have spoken to 
a lot of teenagers since the pandemic. My kind of uh, clinical practice has increased with that age group. And I've encouraged every single one of them to go back to their parents and try and talk to them about um, developing, if you like, or, or um, adjusting the boundaries according to the social context. So yes, they're on Zoom all day on their schooling. Yes, they then get onto their gaming devices and so on. Yes, they then get onto social media. And yes, it's really important that those forums allow them to stay connected and stay part of a kind of social network. And I think for parents, it's difficult. They're under a lot of pressure. Um, and I think the instinct of a parent is to move into control. And I think that's, that's a problem. I mean, lockdown is governmental control. So if you then to try to do micro controlling in the home, you're gonna end up with loads of rows with no space to um, allow those rows to kind of disperse and so on. So um, lots of thoughts about it. But in essence, when your teenager is stomping around the place and in a mood, much better to be standing shoulder to shoulder with them and realizing that they are suffering from this kind of, I suppose, repression at a time when they should be spreading their wings, than tell them to stop being so moody, get a grip and lay the table, because you're just gonna get a massive backlash. So I think for parents, it's really important to stand back and recognize the container that their teenager is in, which is, massively at odds with where they should be at the moment, spreading their wings and engage with more tolerance, more curiosity and understand that the impact on our children, whether they're tiny and supposedly going to nursery or teenagers and ready to leave the family home, the parents really need to take a deep breath and understand the social context and how that is affecting uh, teens and children because they're at a really steep stage of learning. Completely. And I think that's absolutely true. And, you know, one of the issues there that I've noticed with my two boys who are 12 and 15 is that, you know, they used to be quite sort of tech addicted, I would say, in the sense that, you know, whenever they felt upset or anxious or sad, they would immediately go to their tech. That was sort of their default position. What I've noticed now is that it's definitely worse. I mean, you know, you literally can't get their head out of the phone. You can't get them off their screens. It's almost become, it's become completely habitual for them to be just, you know, their screen is their main friend. So, you know, what I try and do is insist on family meals and I say let's sit down for lunch and let's sit down for dinner and that's all I seem to be able to do or you know let's go for a walk from time to time but all that is met with huge amounts of resistance and sort of anger and and uh and my eldest will say, well, you know, I'm with my friends and I'm socializing with my friends and you've got to leave me, et cetera. And I think you're right. But like, where does one draw that line? And what are the long-term consequences? So if schools do resume as they're meant to say in March, how do we handle the fact that there has been this increased habit and has it rewired their neural pathways for something that we're, we're not going to be prepared for and that we're going to have to somehow prune back Okay, two questions. Firstly, where do you draw the line? One of the things I would say, I work with a lot of people who have eating disorders. I was gonna take you off piste for a second. Lots of families say, I want you to come to family meals and that's the point of connection. It is also often a battleground. And that's where sometimes disordered eating can evolve from because families try to put together the family meal with communication. And I think that we need to separate them up. So with my own kids, um, I say to them, listen, I just want to talk to you. I just want some time to check in with you and talk to you. If you think, if you think about all the psychological um, experiments and so on, we know that the primary uh, focus for anyone is attachment. That is the primary focus. So why muddle it with a family meal? Attachment is our primary a uh, core social motive. So let's go after attachment as our greater kind of counterpart, if you like, to any addictive process. So I say to my kids, listen, I know that you're on schooling on Zoom or you're at university on Zoom and I know it's where you socialize. Alongside that, I wanna stay connected to you. I wanna know what's going on. I want us to be able to chat. So I look for 
contact with my kids. I want to know where they're at. I want to be able to gossip with them, chat with them, connect with them. Not a big, deep and meaningful. Um, you know, I don't yet know any teenager who wants to sit down and have a proper, deep and meaningful with mother or father. Um, yes, with their friends. But I just want to touch base. So it's more like a, an intermittent exchange, 10, 15 minutes, few, a few times through the day. I just want to check in, see how you are, have a bit of a laugh, have some positive interaction. I want to know, and I give this back to them, I want to know that they're eating healthily, I want to know that they're drinking water, and I want to know that they're doing something other than sitting in front of a screen with their brains. And I've explained that kicking a ball around, going out for a walk, walking the dog, sweeping the floor, doesn't matter, it uses a different part of the brain and it keeps me more at ease with them uh, spending so much time in front of screens. I also say that ultimately all I'm trying to do is to do a good parent job. It's not my problem if they end up with prejudiced neuro pathways. It's theirs. It's their life. It's not for me to sweep up or for me to prune, particularly not for an older teen. It's their consequence, it's their legacy. Now, if I carry that and I say, what am I going to do to help counterbalance your dysfunctional patterns of behavior? They'll abdicate responsibility. I become the consequence and they'll never engage in their own process. So I'm a great believer in promoting attachment, good self-care and explaining that it's not because I want to control their process. It's because I want to impart what I understand back to them so that they can survive this and more than survive this, thrive through it. I think there are good lessons to be learned around boundaries, resilience, different ways of communicating, managing to stay connected through COVID is an extraordinary thing to be able to do. So I'm a huge supporter of it. But I also want you to be able to stay connected to me, your mum, and to your siblings. So promoting attachment, really important. Popping into their rooms, going for a walk, then coming into the kitchen when you're washing up, not insisting that they do the dishwasher, but just having them lounging about, even if they're half on their phones, and chatting to them. Really important just to keep those connections. And then have the family meal. And then have, you know, those things. I would say disentangle the chat from the meals. Because then they all sit down and you've got all that rebellion going on. And, you know, you really don't want to be mixing those things up. And then um, the, when they go back to school, it's their challenge to overcome. What's it like for them to go back into a social network and be around people when they've achieved the kind of shortcut intimacy that happens when you're online? Because you don't have the regulation of being with another person. So you just say things, mean or nice, it doesn't really matter. You just say things because you have that kind of protection of not being in the same room as somebody. So uh, it's a distorted way of uh, creating, I suppose, attachment and relationship. So they're going to be nervous and they're going to compensate by being overconfident or by being shy. And it is their process, their journey, not ours as parents. Ours is to remind them of the extraordinary circumstances we're in, to deliver them with patience, to uh, show the understanding that this is difficult and to stand back with them and support them to take those steps to go back into, you know, face-to-face -face social setting and support them through that transition. And I think there'll be mood swings, there'll be shifts in friendships. I think it will be a difficult time, but they'll come through it. You have to trust that your child will come through because if you uh, rescue, if you step in to micromanage, you might have the best answer in the world, but your meta message, your subconscious message is, I don't think you can do this. So whilst you're delivering them with a great idea, your other message is, you don't, you can't do this, I don't trust you. So you'll be eroding their self-esteem whilst delivering them with an answer. And it's the wrong way around. You need to be saying, it's tough, it's going to be a difficult transition, you need to be able to tolerate all the mood swings and you need to believe in them. And weather the storm, whether that is to stay on Zoom for God knows how long, or whether that's to support them back into face to face. We need to stand back and believe in our children. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And so one of the things, two things that I wanted to, to take you up on, one of them was you were talking about self-care and how important it is to teach our children to practice self-care, because ultimately, you know, that really is the difference between dysfunctional tech use in some ways 
and functional tech users if you break it up and practice self-care around it. The other one is connection, which you've covered quite a lot. What would be your advice to young people, teens, and also even adults in terms of self-care during this time? Well, I think that self-care is self-esteem in action. Okay, so if I actually care about myself, then I will take care of myself. But if I don't care about myself, then I won't take care of myself. And that's a downward spiral. So the answer is, even if I don't really care about myself, if I practice self-care, I will begin to care about myself. So we have to start with the action and not wait until we feel like it. And that's self-discipline. That is just knowing that when I get up, I make my bed, I draw my curtains, even if I have to close them again because it's easier on the screen to watch a screen with the curtains closed. When I get up, before I get downstairs for breakfast or whatever, I draw the curtains and let the light in. Open the windows, let the air in. Brush your teeth, shower, make your bed, all tiny forms of self-care, but really important. Your external environment can not only reflect how you feel on the inside, but it can reinforce it. Go downstairs, eat something healthy, have a glass of water, say hello to your family. Just say hello. doesn't have to be a big one, but just say hello. Connect with the kind of mainframe. If then you go back up to your bedroom or whatever you use tech in and you want to close the windows, close the curtain and commit to whatever it is you're doing, schooling or gaming or whatever, fine. But then schedule a break and try to honor that break. Notice your own negotiation around actually, do you know what? I'm in a game. I'll leave it for another 10 minutes, another 10 minutes, another 10 minutes. And then two hours pass. Notice how difficult it is for you to come off something and be conscious of that and realize if that's the case, tech is bigger than you. In Alcoholics Anonymous, we say the man takes a drink, the drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man. And the same applies to tech. So if as a teenager or as a kid, you're noticing that you are unable to stop once you've started, see that as a warning sign. See it as a warning sign. Your parents might be annoyed, but you should be worried. Okay. So if that's happening to you, put the brakes on, step away, go and do something else. And sometimes it's difficult to know what else to do. So when you're in a kind of calm state of mind, write down five things that you're happy to do in inverted commas, if you were to break, and then just have the self-discipline to go and do one of them. Walk the dog, do the dishwasher, go and talk to someone, walk around the block, start running, whatever it is. Because running and walking, for example, uh, stimulate left and right side of the brain. And it's very good for calming you. It's very good for letting go of pent up energy and for recalibrating. So that will make you more effective on your screen, better at your gaming and probably better able to concentrate at school. So I just think really getting interested in yourself as your own asset, as your own vehicle, instead of looking at your parents as being a pain in the ass and you know getting in the way of what you wanna do, Notice you've got to live with yourself for the rest of your life. So take care of those boundaries. It doesn't mean you can't go back to the gaming. It just means you need to learn how to manage yourself. Avoid the sugars, avoid the quick fix foods and water, hydrate. That's really, really good advice. And I think that works for a lot of parents as well as kids. And the other thing you mentioned was, you know, the boundary between healthy tech use and addiction, which is essentially where you're using a tech use to sort of address your feelings, manage your feelings, deal with your feelings rather than feel them and deal with them yourself. What would be your advice if you notice that your children or adults or, or teenagers are actually using their tech to, as a sort of addictive process to manage their own feelings? How would you address that? Okay. What I would say is I'd say that if they are using tech to avoid how they feel, not manage, not deal with, because that's exactly what they're not doing, but to avoid their feelings, there are two things that I need to say. The first is If they're doing that, and this might be tough for some parents to hear, but if they're doing that, it might be because you as a parent don't model the behavior that says this is how you deal with your feelings. And when I say deal with your feelings, I mean, accept that we are all feelings beings and uh, we are entitled to the full repertoire of emotion in a calm and curious way. So it's not 
I'm feeling angry, therefore I've got a right to be angry and I'm now going to stop around the place and be angry. It's to say, I'm angry, I wonder why. I wonder what's getting to me. I wonder if I'm okay. Take a moment and to consider what it is that's got under your skin and then try to literally, as you say, address it. If you are modeling that kind of behavior, then you are in much better position to go to your teenager or your kid if you notice or you're concerned that they are outsourcing their emotional process to their tech use. And to say to them, listen, this isn't about the tech use. I'm happy for you to be on tech. I would just like to have a moment with you between when that rupture happened and you get on the tech to kind of process out knowledge, mark, Again, doesn't have to be a deep and meaningful, but just to acknowledge, I feel bored, I feel frustrated, I feel so sad, I feel so lonely, I feel so frightened that I can't survive this, I feel so cut off from all my friends. Any of those things, just allow them to touch those feelings, to stimulate them as feelings that then go through the body as an experience because you don't want them to be separate from their emotional process. It will create a backlog, which will create a kind of binge further down the line to clear that backlog. And then say, they don't have to understand why they feel all those things or process them all through and put them into a file with a bow on. They just need to have them stimulated so they acknowledge them. Then go on tech. Then say, okay, go for it, go on tech. I'm glad you got something to do. If, however, you're a parent who isn't good with their emotions, we have a problem because going to your child to say, I know you feel sad, talk to me about it. When you're a very sad person and you've repressed it and you eat on your feelings or you, I don't know, codependently fix everybody else because you don't want to look at yourself, you will not be safe territory for your child to bring their feelings to you. And that's where we have a bit of a problem because I think a lot of parents that I meet anyway, so it's a prejudiced group of people, aren't good with their feelings. And therefore they can see the feelings in their teen, they're worried about the feelings in their child, but they are not equipped to deal with them because they haven't dealt with them themselves. So I would say if that's going on, take a moment. And I always promote the 12 step fellowships. I can't help myself, they're a free forum for people to go to. Um, you don't have to self-identify as a codependent or as somebody who came out of a dysfunctional childhood yourself in order to attend these fellowships like the Adult Child of the Addictive Family System, ACA, or Codependence Anonymous, CODA. You just have to be curious about your own process. So I think if you are a parent who is worried about your child, but you don't feel across your own emotional process, Find a way to get across your own emotional process first. Talk to somebody who is equipped to help you with that. And then go to your child to say, I'm concerned about you. Otherwise, you might send your child further to ground. And if you're middle ground territory, you don't have any big, heavy difficulty with your own feelings and you're worried about your child, I would just say, mark it. Mark it in a really casual way. You seem sad. You seem lonely. What you're going to get back is, of course I am. Oh, my God. Why do you have to keep doing all of that? You're going to get that rebellion. Don't worry about it. Just say, it's OK, I'm here for you in whatever way you wish. Because in suggesting the feeling, you might be able to stimulate or mark it as well. I think avoiding the emotions and allowing them all to erupt dispute um, is a way of distorting those feelings and making them worse. So keep it simple trust the process, take a look at your own unconscious messaging, try to support your child to separate their emotional process from their tech use. I think that's fantastic. That's such good advice, Mandy. I just have one more quick question. There's this thing known as Zoom fatigue, which is, you know, people just on Zoom all day and this applies both to kids and adults. And I presume you've covered a lot of that in the self-care, but is there anything else that you would like to address around the Zoom fatigue? Absolutely. So I work on Zoom all the time with people in an incredibly intense way. OK, so I am locked on and listening. Once I come to the end of a session, I'm quite prone to turning up the music 
and leaping around the room and just connecting with my core energy, maybe shaking off or connecting with, sometimes I'm not sure which it is, but I think music, water, air, just breathe and move because we get locked into one position, one concentration, it does become really tiring. So let your whole body carry this, not just your eyes, not just your head, which is obviously all we frame, but to let your, just again, to let your whole body carry the experience, to nourish yourself and to, as I say, drink water. But I love dance. I love music. I love just bringing myself back into the room, take a breath, settle down, go into the next session. So uh, that would be my advice. That's fantastic. <laughs> Mandy, that's brilliant. I mean, you've given us so much to work with. Is there anything else that you would just want to add that we haven't covered? We have just... Yeah, possibly. One other thing. I love talking to you too as well. I love your curiosity. One of the things that I often get asked about and is being promoted is families that I've spoken to have said that they've been advised to keep really rigorous timetables to try and allow the timetable that would exist outside of this context rigorously in place, you know, keep, keep the control. And I'm not sure I agree. I think it shouldn't be anarchy, but I think that each family should be looking at what their natural rhythm is. Certainly, um, and I'm fortunate, I suppose, because I have some clients in different time zones. So I'm using Zoom at times when the rest of the family are asleep, which is great because I have privacy and quiet in the middle of the night. I think really have a look at the 24 hour timetable, the 24 hour clock. Yes, the kids have got to get up and go to school because that's when school starts. But for those children who are able to school under their own steam, have a look at when their most effective time actually is instead of forcing them to get up at 8 a.m. and you know work to some predisposed timetable that existed before COVID. Really look at when your family comes alive. Really look at when your family is most effective and create your own timetable. Make sure that they have their three meals a day. Make sure, of course, that they're you know, drinking water and so on and so forth. And make sure that they are everybody is achieving to the best of their capacity, whatever their responsibility is. But I think this idea of up at eight, lunch at one, supper at seven, bed at 10, I think is a micromanaging form of control within a greater kind of atmosphere of control being locked down. And I think it creates further frustration. So I would invite families to really think about what timetable works best for you and create your own microcosm, reduce the frictions that are unnecessary, work together within this context and let's all get through it. I love that. And I mean, I wish that we could practice that more. I mean, you know, I have one night owl who's 15 and he'll be up till four or five if I let him. And then one who's a morning person and he'll get up at eight and go to bed at 10 or nine. And I try to encourage that. I try. Well, I mean, I don't encourage it, but I don't fight it. I've given up sort of fighting it. And I think you're right, being a little flexible. I just wish society would follow suit. And I wish schools would let us do that a bit more, because I think, you know, with teenagers especially, you know, they are more effective if you let them sleep in the morning and they will, you know, work better that way, a lot of them. So that's fantastic advice. Excellent, Mandy. Well, you were wonderful. wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it and have a wonderful rest of the day and um, look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you, your loved ones or clients may take to start their healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with our latest interviews on integrative mental health. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program.